uh, thank you for the opportunity. And I have a lot of slides because I want to leave you. I don't know if the slides are going to be distributed. Uh, that'd be good. I, I get the nod, yes, that they are. So I have plenty in here that is more than what I'm, I'm going to probably run through them a little bit quickly. So just uh, be patient with me. And uh, I can sympathize with you to a certain extent. I was a podiatrist in Chicago for 19 years, so I understand to make money or when you're a doctor, they think everybody who has DR that you're, you're rich. Well, I didn't get rich at podiatry, but I enjoyed it. And, and uh, relating back to the first talk this morning about mitigating risk, I, I believe that if you comply with the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, that'll be one good step towards mitigating risk. So I'm with the, what we call the Los Angeles District Office, and we still call it to an extent, and if I keep repeating it during the day, pardon me because the presentation I'm, I'm giving, and some of you may have seen it earlier this year or know about it by reading it, I feel it's going to be important to talk about this new uh, area that we're going into in terms of the field offices. So let's, let's get going now. So there was a charge by Dr. Hamburg some years ago, I believe it was 2013, to FDA, but mainly to the Office of Regulatory Affairs. So let's backtrack a second. If you're not aware, FDA is just not one FDA, although that's a good moniker and that's very important is that we're one team or one family. But how I think of it now being with FDA 15 years after being in practice is that FDA, to me, functions more like a Washington, D.C. FDA, and then there's all the field offices from Alaska to Puerto Rico, and we're an ORA, Office of Regulatory Affairs. So very basic. I'm sure you all know that, but I need to repeat that. So there was a charge to the field offices to develop a plan and there was management throughout, and, and now we're, we had the stand-up on May 15th. So as you can see from this slide, I really don't have a good shot at it, but mainly that area in the box shows you what we were like before May 15th. To some extent, we still are. The district offices, just like the one a few miles away where I go to at Jamboree and MacArthur, uh, we're, we think we're the largest office in, in the country as far as the scope of our activities of what we do. Um, we're still called the Los Angeles District Office, even though we're based in Irvine, which is weird. Uh, but we have multiple smaller resident post offices. But really, we're now based on divisions. So we were geographic before. There still are geographical, physical offices that people go to, although we're going more to a telework model, fortunately, because I live in Corona and that's a crazy drive, and uh, so I do some teleworking. But most of what we can do these days, outside of having our investigators physically be at your company, is we can do a lot of it through teleworking. So we went from a geographical model to now this one that's called program alignment. And again, I'm sure 90% of those here have heard the term. It's here to stay. There was some jockeying about early on saying, is it really going to stick? It's really going to stick unless something changes it my opinion, in the future. I don't see anything changing it. So we've gone to the program alignment model. So although we're based in DC, our upper management, we have management represented in the field offices, and we're based on a commodity. So this slide, and I highlighted in yellow on the slide the areas that you may dovetail with to an extent, just my projection, more than the other areas shown on the slide, such as, I'm gonna to have to get over here a little closer, uh, com consumer complaints. Someone might complain about you, and I've had recently a company, medical device company, that complained about another medical device company. We also have uh, FOIA. When you request documentation about yourself or another company, you might have to go through the Freedom of Information Act. Recalls, you might have to deal with our recall co coordinators. And now, because of program alignment, I'm in the, and here's one of the new buzzwords that they've, they've brought on, and I'm sure you use this too. It, it kind of bugs me, all these buzzwords all, over the decades. I, I wish I could just go back to podiatry and <laughs> not think about certain buzzwords, but in, in the business community, it seems, it seems like they've been implementing it. So now everything is the silo. So I'm in my medical device silo. 
And we have compliance officers like me, and you can see these other areas that I don't think you're going to interface with as much in ORA, Office of Regulatory Affairs. The next couple of slides are fairly wordy. I'm not going to read them off. You can see here some of the things that are happening. What we're going from the model before program alignment, before May 15, 2017, and where we're going to. What you should know, and I'm sure if you've had reorganizations in your companies, is that there has to be some patience. There has to be some working things out. Does that mean that you shouldn't be ready, that we're disorganized? No, we're not disorganized. We're as organized as we've ever been, if not more, even in a transition period. But what I'm saying is, just like anything in life, my view is that there's going to be a period where you have to work out processes. You have to create procedures that go to your new processes, and you do it. If you're starting up a company, which is part of this whole lecture series, and or if you're just doing a, an internal reorganization, you have this, the, the shell of things that are working well, and then you're making changes according to certain conditions. And that's what's going on with program alignment. We're basing things on the commodity in our vertical silos versus being spread out. You should be aware of Mel Plazier. She is, so if we have this Office of Regulatory Affairs, ORA, she's at the top, and she's based in Washington, D.C. Now, on the side of uh, enforcement and import operations, how you might interface with them is that if by chance, unfortunately, your company is taken to court by FDA, either through a seizure of the product or an injunction, a consent decree, they're going to have an opinion. They're going to weigh in on the evidence. I'm going to be part of that, too, because I'm the frontline person who takes the evidence from the investigators, and I work it up as a potential legal case. So even though I'm not an attorney, I a, was a podiatrist, surgeon, foot surgeon, now I was, then was an investigator, now a compliance officer, by my training and by what's built in to the system legally, I'm actually able to work up a case legally uh, based on the evidence, even though I'm not an attorney. So if you have any questions about that system, then <laughs> I guess you'll have to investigate that and, and bring it up to someone, but that's the way it works. And then on the science side, we have a director of regulatory science. So again, this is Office of Enforcement. They'll weigh in on enforcement cases or court cases. They're also for device people that bring devices in or import or export them out, and you have to comply with certain provisions of the, of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, namely the 800 series in the, in the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, and I hope you have a copy at your company or you can access it online. That's a very important uh, book to, to be aware of. That's the, our Bible, as I call it, regulatory-wise. And also the Code of Federal Regulations, which is when our investigators go out you might see them with a small book, and that'll be the regulations they may cite to when they cite you for something they feel you've done wrong. So this is the map of, we call OEIO, Office of Enforcement Import Operations. Not going to dwell on that. As far as Office of Regulatory Science, I don't think you're going to interface with it that much, but what you should be aware of is one of the laboratories across the country for FDA that may look at a medical device and physically take it apart and have their engineers do all different testing, whatever, as part of maybe a regulatory case or just to understand the technology is what we call WEAC, and they're based in the northeast part of the country. So I put an arrow where WEAC is located. I think it's the New England area. And I put an arrow just where our laboratory is here in our Irvine office, just a couple of miles away. You say, well, what kind of, what of our, what our devices are going to go there? The chance will be minimal, but we have the technical on paper capability for drug, biologic, medical device, anything we think of it as non food to be tested at our office. But in general, medical devices, and even those I find are far fewer than testing a drug for potency or t testing a food for for it being tainted or having a microorganism like salmonella. So the chances of having to interface with a laboratory with FDA on the medical device side 
I, I believe is minimal, but you should be aware of it. Uh, I have this, just for completeness sake, I have a slide on the Office of Partnerships. So there's going to be an office in ORA who's going to interface with the different relationships of you know, state partners, uh, people who are setting specification standards for medical devices, et cetera. So we do have an area in FDA. I don't really interface with someone like this. I have to be aware of who my state liaisons are and other agencies within California and our whole division. And coming up on the slide, you'll see how we went from just Southern California, Arizona, we went to a massive part of the country that I'm part of now. I think that's going to be the eye-opening thing if you're not aware of already. So the section of ORA that I'm in at the highest level is called Office of Medical Products and Tobacco Operations. You can see some of the principles down at the bottom. Alonzo Cruz, you're probably very familiar, a few years ago he went to Washington, D.C. to head up the pharmaceutical arm of ORA. Again, when I mention pharma or device or biologics, be aware this is ORA. We're a subset of all of ORA. You still have all the centers that represent all those commodities. And that's where program alignment is interesting because now we're in that vertical silo where we join the people in our particular area of expertise in DC and those are the people at CDRH. I put this in here because I have kind of an affinity and affection for the clinical research realm. When I was an investigator, I did a lot of clinical research inspections where we go in and look at your data, we look at the consents, informed consents, et cetera. Well, we have a subset of, of clinical research uh, that is, we call our BIMO program, and some of that involves medical devices. It's not always, as you know, drug, drugs that are being studied. So you should be aware of the BIMO program. There is a portion of it under ORA. This is BIMO's division. So BIMO now, the section that Southern California is for clinical research within ORA, so sending out the investigators to your businesses who do clinical research, is all within that one color on the left and then the one in the blue is, is the other division. This is the main area for me. Jan Welch is at the top of the program. So now we have programs. So if I'm in the medical device program in ORA, which is tethered to CDRH. So if you get the feel for it now. So Jan Welch is a few steps ahead of me, or uh, above me. So she's the head of our program. And medical device, if, if you can look over to the dark green on the left, that's the division so instead of calling it Los Angeles District Office, we're going to call it Division 3, or we're not sure we may call it Division West. We're, it's really Division 3, but it might be called West at some point. So if you took a, a line and drew it from, let's say, Dallas, Texas, to Seattle, Seattle is San Diego, and San Diego line over to Dallas, that should capture about 90% of the total area. Why is that important? Is that you may be affected in this re, uh, way. We have two compliance officers that do what I do, look at evidence collected by our investigators who are in our Dallas office. We have two in our Denver office. We have two in our San Francisco office and one in our LA office in Irvine, which is me. About 10 days ago, one of my good friends, he's a dentist, I'm a podiatrist. He retired a couple of weeks ago, Bill Vitale. He, some of you might know him. He used to be an investigator, then he was a compliance officer like me. He decided it was just enough. He had enough years in life doing that. And so, uh, you know, I'm going to miss him because we sat next to each other and talked about device cases all the time for several years. So now it's just me as the compliance officer in our office if you need to contact a compliance officer. Again, why it's important is if a compliance officer in the Dallas office puts their hand up and says, I'll review the next case. I've got some free time. I've, I just finished the case. I, I can do another one. And let's say it's your company that was inspected and these problems were found. Our new model is evidence from your company in Irvine might be sent electronically over to a compliance officer in Dallas. They may not understand you. They may not know you. They may not understand Southern California culture and have related to you at conferences like I have. This is a reality because they're going to look neutral, which may be good, may be bad, because 
As far as the influence factor, in my opinion, it's not going to be there because if they take the case on, uh, about your company, everything is just going to be, which should be, everything is based on the evidence. There isn't going to be any effect it is by you meeting me at a conference like this. And that's just the way it is with this program alignment. So contact information. A fact sheet was given to me. I'm not going to give you the fact sheet, but I took the information direct from the fact sheet. I was told by my director of compliance branch, her name is Kelly Shepard. I'll have a slide about her in a second. Uh, she's in my building, so she's one step ahead of me. She's head of compliance for that whole division three, that whole big dark green blob on that previous slide. So she gave me a sheet that the investigators apparently have been told, I don't believe they're going to be handing them out, but they may, but at least they're going to be telling companies when they do inspections about different contact information that they should be aware of that I'm presenting today. So this came directly from that fact sheet. So if you need to get in touch with FDA about responding to us about some, something that when the investigator, they wrote you up for a 483 and you want to respond to it, or if you have questions in general about the process, there's a site there. If you're involved in a recall or you may think of doing a voluntary recall, and as you know, you can do a voluntary recall, which we appreciate. You can do a mandatory recall, which we force it on you, but it has to go through a lot of hoops. Then uh, recalls, you might want to dovetail with that site there. Those are the people who handle medical device recalls in ORA. So we've got to keep titrating it to what we're talking about. Correspondence. I would say before you put this in stone, even though I was given this information off a fact sheet, check with whoever the compliance officer or investigator that you're dealing with on an inspection. Yes, we're going more towards electronic, more scan things, but be careful because some companies through their counsel feel that they should be still providing hard copies. So instead of sending us responses that are this high off the floor, which I've gotten, sending it electronically where we can upload it to certain databases and FDA is more advantageous for us. And we're going away from hard copies. So in general, send us your responses electronically, but think about possibly still sending hard copies. You should check with your own internal policy council and then check with FDA to make sure that sending an email is the way to go or some other fashion. Other contacts, so again, we have Jan Welch, who's the program director for medical devices for ORA. Then you have the person who's head of each of those colored divisions, I was saying. They're called the program division director. Currently, we have an actor in that position. She's based in the Dallas office. Her name is Sherry Shambaugh. This is for information's sake, because if she's not promoted to get that permanent position, it's possible that there'll be another actor for a certain amount of time until they hire someone who's going to be the permanent program division director. So she's one step above, one under Jan Welch, one above my boss, who's Kelly Shepard, director of compliance. We also have on the investigation side, so when an investigator comes to you, we have someone from division three, if you visualize that map before, who's the director of investigations for division three. Some more resources, and again, recalls is an important matter. Mandatory reporting, such as your uh, uh, updates to certain uh, things, such as medical device reports, the initial ones, and then you know, follow-ups to things like that. So you, sh you should be aware of certain sites. The DICE site used to be the small business site. That's very good. In case your questions aren't being answered, people aren't getting back to you. You can funnel th things through DICE. And I find that they'll, they'll churn things up and, and get an answer. So that's a valuable site also. We have an ombudsman. Uh, I remember uh, her from a case that I had several years ago. I haven't interfaced with her in a while, uh, but I've heard good things. And they'll all, she'll also work to answer your questions if no one's answering your questions. I wouldn't just, that doesn't mean coming off of that so you should be sending emails left and right to these people. Please don't. Start, it's a, FDA is like any government authority, in my opinion, different than my, I did in my private practice. Of course, I was at the top of the heap in my practice. Everything is that famous chain of command. Unless you're working with someone directly already, well, other than that, start at 
the ground level and work up, up, up and up. Don't just shoot an email to the top person, unless you, that's your style and you like to do that. Um, resources and, co and more contacts. So I'm ending, those were the slides that were pre-approved, so I'm not going to be embellished. Those were approved by internally in FDA that I could <laughs> show to you, because those slides are also being shown across the country to other groups. But I put some other slides in because when I go to these conferences, and I've been speaking since uh, 2009 for FDA, I find that they'll, they'll ask me a question such as, tell us something new, something we don't know. And it's always hard for me to cobble together something new because, again, I don't represent CDR, CDRH, which you may interface with a lot. I represent the local office and now program Division Three, but things I find are very interesting and important is you should sign up at FDA.gov to get updated on all the medical device guidance as they come out. I bet you you do, but some of you may, do, may not, you should. So I picked some of them that I saw from a list the past year, year and a half, and I tried to pick out buzzwords of things that are like hot things to think about. Benefit risk, patient preference information, cybersecurity who I see Shep Bentley uh, will be speaking on that later today. And then real world evidence. So these are buzzwords. And if you re look at the guidance to see what FDA's current thinking is on some really hot topics. So I just picked four of them. And I'm winding down. If um, you're not aware, Dr. Gottlieb is, has been appointed and cleared as the uh, FDA commissioner. He's been in his position for a bit of time already. I would suggest, and I just put this, I just took a snip of the FDA.gov site and put him up there. I'm sure you've heard some comments by him, maybe uh, by listening into a podcast or something, or, or maybe in print. You should visit FDA.gov or just research him on the internet to see what type of initiatives he's been a part of, things he's been talking about. Uh, one is the opioid uh, situation, opioid crisis. Uh, so you should pay attention to Dr. Gottlieb and what he's had to say. I just want to pick a few more that I didn't get a chance to put on the slide. So with Dr. Price, who's head of Health and Human Services, we have Reimagine Health and Human Services. I haven't exactly figured out what that means, but I'll have to, even I'll have to read up about it on, the, on that one. As far as Dr. Gottlieb, some things that uh, he's been promoting in his short time as commissioner, uh, the medical innovation, uh, we have in silico regulatory models, and yes, I looked up, so I knew someone might ask me, what does in silico mean? In silico means that it's virtual patients or things done by computer. It's from the Latin, in silico means in silicon, pertaining to semiconductors, uh, chips and things like that. So uh, I was prepared, because I have a feeling someone would say, well, what does in silico mean? Uh, so that's where you're doing clinical trials, or at least prepping for clinical trials by looking at information garnered through virtual patients. You have the 21st Century Cures Act, and you may have seen a guidance recently, not a guidance, a Federal Register notice, where greater than 1,000 Class II medical devices will not need a pre-market application or a 510K, as you know it. Uh, we also have the software pre-certification process. And with soft, software as a medical device, so that's another area. I don't have ex expertise in that, other than when I read my, my reports, working up as a regulatory action. But again, you should be aware of what's going on in the agency at large. I know a lot of you are very concerned with CDRH because they pull the trigger and they do different things uh, as far as regulatory-wise, policy-wise. The scientists look at the medical devices. They have engineers, physicians in DC, but don't forget about us here at the local office because we're now part of program division three in medical devices and we're tethered all the way straight up and down with CDRH, so we're gonna be a big part of this. And I believe that is it. Thank you very much.